Bionicle Adventures 9 Web of Shadows Written by Greg Farshti Recorded by Lena Baltapaz Chapter 3 Matau woke up face down in a gutter. He had been unceremoniously dumped there by his rescuer, who had disappeared. He lifted his head and looked around, noting that it was the middle of the night and he was somewhere in the ruins of Ga Metru. Hello! He called. Nukama? Wanua? Nuju! Anewa! No answer came from the darkness. Matau shrugged and, with some reluctance, added, Vakama! When no response came, Toa Matau reached up to clear the grit from his eyes. The first sight that greeted his newly cleared vision was his own reflection in the liquid protodermis pooled by the gutter, but the face that looked back at him was not that of a Toa. It was the face of a monstrous beast. No! Matau shouted. His hands shot to his face, desperately seeking evidence that what he saw was not real. But it was. He could feel the rough contours of his features where once there had been the smooth, hard, metallic surface of a Kanohi mask. But this isn't me, he said softly. Then anger rose in him, anger at the way he looked, anger at Makuta for destroying his city, anger at Vakama for leading them into the trap. He swiped at the puddle, stirring its surface and distorting his reflection. As if it could get any more distorted, he thought. When the water had calmed once more, he could see other bestial shapes approach him. The rest of the Toa had arrived. It's all right, Matau, said Nokama. Matau looked up at her, then at the others. They were no longer Toa. They were not even Matoran or Turaga. They were beasts, monsters, things out of a Matoran scare story. All right? He snapped. You call this all right? We're all alive, Nokama replied. We'll find a way out, together. That's what friends do, Wunua added, his tone more gentle than Matau had ever heard it. Matau rose and turned to Vakama, thrusting his face right up to the toe of Tom Metru. I don't hear you saying that, smelthead. What's the matter? Too busy cooking up another master plan? Vakama stepped back, snarling. I'm through making plans. Well, that's the first happy good thing I've heard since I became ugly, Matau replied. Nuju stepped between the two. Regardless of how we look, it might be better if we use our energy to find out how and why we become... <sighs> whatever it is we are. Nokama nodded. The sooner we do that, the sooner we can rescue the Matoran. Matau turned to them, unconvinced. How are we to be saving when we're the ones that need saving? No one had an answer. Then a voice laden with age and wisdom broke the stillness, its source nearby yet unseen. If you are wise, if you wish to be yourselves again. Six strange figures emerged from the shadows. Each had a face much like that of a Rakshi, and walked hunched over like a Rahi beast. The one in front was dark red, and he surveyed the toll one by one. Then you will listen, he said. Rudaka stood in the gloom of the sundial chamber. The great timing devices had stopped dead during the dual eclipse in Metronui. The moment Makuta had waited for had come and gone, the moment when he would seize his destiny. But the Toa had frustrated him, defeated him, and now he lay trapped behind a sealed layer of protodermis. The ebony viceroy of the Vizorak gazed at the stone in the palm of her hand. It was rough and black like obsidian, carved by her from the outer surface of Makuta's prison, even so small an effort had cost her much pain, for only a Toa could pierce the shell that surrounded the Master of Shadows without paying the price. Rest, my Makuta, she cooed to the stone. Sleep, and know that as you do, I draw close to waking you. She smiled, an expression that would have sent even the bravest Viserac running for refuge. The Toa have returned, as you said they would. Even now their broken bodies are being brought to me, so I may drain them of their elemental powers, powers I will use to shatter the wretched seal they bound you with, and that keeps us apart. Rudaka gently, lovingly placed the Makuta stone into her breastplate. It began to pulse like a heartlight. And then, there will be no need for these charades, she whispered. Together, you and I will... She stopped abruptly. Her expression turned hard as the stone. Coldly, she demanded, What is it? 
Vizorak stepped out of the thick shadows, looking like it wanted more than anything to run. But if the message it carried was not delivered, Rudaka would track the unfortunate spider creature down, and then... It shuddered at the thought and began its report. Rudaka listened intently. After only a few minutes, she interrupted, The Toa? Why do you speak of them as if they're still alive? The Vizorak's mouth was dry. It glanced about, making note of where all the chamber's exits were. Then, very quietly, it answered her question. Rudaka's reaction was immediate. Whirling, she smashed a pillar into dust. The Vizorak backed away before she decided to vent her anger on it. But the Viceroy of the Hordes had no interest in one mere spider. No, her rage was reserved for a very specific group of individuals, whose name she spat out as if it were poison. Rahaga. Kitongo. After he had spoken the word, Rahaga Norik waited for some reaction, but the looks on the Toa's faces indicated that none of them had ever heard the name before. Onewa, at least, was willing to pretend he understood. The key to Nangu, he said, matter-of-factly. Nork shot the Toa Hordika of Stone a look, then continued. Kitangu was a most honorable Wahi, skilled in the ways of Venoms, not to mention our only hope to stand against the Vizorak Horde. If you are to be the Toa you once were, it is Kitangu you must seek. But what are we now? asked Nokama. The Vizorak's Hordika Venom courses within you, Nork replied grimly. If it is not neutralized, it will take root, and Hordika you will remain. Forever! Nuju frowned. His mind had been sifting through theories ever since the strangers first appeared. Now he looked at Nork and said quietly, Like you? I am a Rahaga. Nork is my name. Then the bizarre-looking being gestured to his companions and introduced each of them in turn. Gaki. Bomanga. Kulas. Pooks. Uruni. A moment of silence followed. It was finally broken by Matau, who said awkwardly, So, how's it working out for you? Has its moments, Norik replied. This is not one of them. Nokama shook her head. In the end, it didn't matter what these Rahaga were or why. All that mattered to her was what they knew. Can you take us to Kitongu? she asked. Iruni stifled a laugh. Norik turned and looked at the fellow Rahaga sternly. Iruni! Nokama looked from one to the other. I don't understand. What Iruni so inappropriately suggests is that this will be difficult. Norik answered. We Rahaga have come to Metronui in search of a Kitango ourselves, and there are those that, well, doubt his existence entirely. Nuju's eye narrowed. And you? Norik drew himself up to his full height and said firmly, I believe. Nokama nodded. Then so must we. <laughs> Whoa there, sister, broke in Mateo. Shouldn't we think talk about this? You know, group-like? He turned to Vakala, who was standing apart from the others. What do you think, Mask Maker? The Tohordika of Fire stared into the flames. His tone of voice said that his thoughts were far away. I say that we came to Metronui to rescue the Matoran, not to hunt Rahi. And you have a way to do this? pressed Nork. Perhaps with your new Hordika powers. Powers you have not yet learned to use? I don't know. Don't know? Or don't want to include the rest of us in your thinking? Nork challenged. The Kama turned from the fire to give the Rahaga a hard stare. Then he rose and walked off into the darkness, saying only, Neither. The Kama! Nokama said, shocked at his behavior. Nork started after the troubled Toa Hordika. I will talk to him. What about us? asked Matau. Nork smiled, but there was little humor in the expression. Prepare yourselves. We have a legend to prove. It took some time for Norik to calm the common for the two to arrive at a compromise. Returning to the Toa Hordika, the pair suggested that the attempts to rescue the Matoran take priority over the search for Kitangu. All six Toa agreed that their own personal concerns about becoming Hordika permanently could not be as important as saving the sleeping victims of Makuta. That they would succeed in rescuing the Matoran, no one doubted. At least, no one willing to speak up and say so. But that still left the problem of how to get them out of the city and to the island above. The Likan, too, was wrecked, and even if it hadn't been, it wasn't big enough to carry close to a thousand Matoran. In the end, it was Matau who suggested they gather the materials to build airships and fly the Matoran to safety. A city overrun by Vizorak and rampaging Rahi made this easier said than done. After a number of harrowing adventures, the Toamechu did finally succeed in getting the items they needed and began constructing and hiding ships. 
Once the Matorn had been saved, there would be no need to delay making an escape from the city. Despite their victory, the Toa Hordika were left more fragmented and disturbed than before. They were rapidly mastering the Rituka spinners they now carried, but had less luck mastering the Rahi sides than themselves. Too often, they had allowed anger to rule their spirits almost to the point of disaster. Bakama, in particular, had been filled with anger for days and had finally reached a point where he avoided the others completely. He spent most of his time wandering the ruins, straying farther away from the camp each day as if straining against an invisible chain that bound him to Nokama and the rest. He surveyed the wreckage of the once proud city, reflecting on what the tall were, what they had been, and what they had become. So lost in thought was he that he sometimes forgot just how much Metrinui had changed. With the archives destroyed by the earthquake, every Rahi that had ever been housed there was now loose and roaming the city. A near-fatal reminder of that came on one of his walks, when a savage Muwaka cat sprang from the rubble to confront him. It snarled at Vakama, muscles tense to spring, and claws ready to rend the Toa Hordika. Vakama reacted purely by instinct. He hunched down, blazer claws raised, and growled like a Rahi. There was no strategy behind his actions, just an animalistic show of strength. Even without his willing it, a Rutaka spinner took shape in the launcher that was now part of his anatomy. The Muwaka took a step back. This creature looked like one of the two-legged ones that had captured the Rahi long ago, but it did not act like one. It acted like a beast, and a formidable beast at that. Deciding there had to be an easier prey than this, the Muwaka turned and disappeared into the darkness. Fakama forced himself to relax. With enormous effort, he pushed down the Hordiga in him and let his rational side return to dominance. What was... he began. It meant you no know, harm. The Toa Hordiga of Fire turned to see Nork approaching. The Rahaga had been silently trailing Vakama since he had left the camp. In time, Vakama's Hordika senses would make it impossible for him to be followed. I begged Diffa, Vakama replied. Norik glanced in the direction the Moaka had gone. It was just scared. Moaka alone is by nature and uncomfortable being close to others. He gestured to Vakama. There's a bit of them in you now. It was then that the Rahaga noticed Vakama's Rituka spinner was still active and waiting to be launched. Careful with that, he said quietly. It's a most powerful tool. Vakama had not even realized the fire spinner was there, but now he willed it to dissipate. Still, it gave him some satisfaction to know it could intimidate the Rahaga just as it had the Mawaka. I certainly mean to find that out, wise one, he replied, with more than a little sarcasm in his voice. Then he turned and walked away, only to be stopped by Norik's voice. And what about your friends? Vakama spun on his heel, growling, Former friends! <laughs> if they think being a leader is so easy, they can try it themselves. True, Nork said, nodding. But they won't succeed without you, or you without them. And how do you know that? I don't, Nork conceded. But the Great Spirit does. Unity, duty, and destiny. If you, Toa, are to rescue the Matoran, you must do so together. This is something you can't change. The Kama stared at the Rahaga for a long moment, digesting his words. Then, he turned again and stalked off into the shadows. Watch me, he snapped. Nork watched him go. Yes, Fakama, that I will do, he said to himself. You bear watching in these dark days. Perhaps even more than you know. End of chapter 3